Hi, I'm Leah Hasledge, president of the Cleveland Association of Broadcasters and a producer at Evergreen Podcast. And welcome to our next CAB conversation with fellow CAB board member, Kenny Crumpton. Hi, Kenny. Hello, Leah. How are you, my dear? I'm good, darling. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you. Thanks and for thank being you. with us today. I know you're super busy kicking it all over town. <laughs> thank you for having me. This is, a, this is a, a pleasure and an honor. It is. It is. Aw. Well, thanks, Kenny. Mm -hmm. And this is your second year on the board? That is correct. That is correct. Yes. And what made you decide to get involved with us? Well, um, you asked me for several <laughs> years once you got involved and and, and prior to uh, other members asked me but I was really just extremely busy I didn't have a lot of spare time and I had several other charities I was working with um, at the time and then as my time and space freed up a bit it was perfect time and I said okay now I have time to dedicate to this because as you know if I'm going to dedicate myself or my time to something I take it very seriously so now I'm in a point or at a point, I should say, where I could dedicate myself to CAB. Of course, it's the future of what we're doing. So uh, I don't even consider it a charity. I consider it a privilege and an honor. Oh, well, thank you for that. And thank you for volunteering your time because anyone that's been a part of the board before and is involved in it now knows it's no easy task and you are devoting your time and it's appreciated. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So everyone in Cleveland knows that you're kicking it, Kenny Crumpton, but a lot of people don't know your story before Cleveland. So kind of give us a, a cliff nose trajectory of your career, starting with your hometown of the great state of Texas. That's right. Uh, the distinguished man from Dallas, Texas. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Dallas is home. I, interesting enough, I came here from California, my last market. So people assumed I was from California, but actually I am a Southern boy. I'm from Dallas, Texas. Uh, mother and father are located there after dad retired from the military after 26 years, I believe. And uh, mom and dad are from very, very small towns in Louisiana. But so after uh, being in the military and going all over literally the world, uh, they wanted to settle in the South, close to home, but in a big city. Uh, so my brother and I could reap the benefits of a great educational system. Um, and Dallas was home, number one, because my mother, my grandmother, my mother's mom, uh, lived there. So we lived with her until my mom and dad got on their feet. Um, uh, fast forward to college, graduated from Howard University, majored in broadcast journalism with a double minor in theater and fashion design. Um, 20 days after I graduated, I was on air in Wichita Falls, Texas, reporting and fill in anchoring, which was quite the experience. So to all the students out there, you're not gonna start in a major a major market 20 or up, you're gonna have to start in small, small, small uh, cities, but don't let that discourage you, stay motivated. I was there for about two and a half years, sent resume tapes out to bigger markets. Wichita Falls uh, at the time is market 138. And then I got the job in Fresno, California uh, which was market 56 um, at the time. And I was there as a, a general assignments reporter. And uh, eventually the plan was to do fill and anchoring. So I was there for 10 years as a general assignment reporter working um, um, pretty much everything from city hall to the police beat to you name it, to the massive forest fires they have out there, you name it, I was assigned to it. Started some really cool franchises out there. My, la <laughs> my last year there, for some reason, the station never had a morning show and all the other stations did. Uh, so they uh, got tons of money from CBS, a CBS affiliate. They got tons of money from CBS to start a morning show. And I was where I wanted to be. I was doing for lack of blood and guts and crime and murder and mayhem uh, for the 11 p.m. news Monday through Friday. And one of the elements they were hoping to separate them from everybody else was to have a fun morning show guy. Now around the newsroom, I was the newsroom cut up, you know, always cracking people up, making jokes. You? Yeah, I know, shocking, right? But the audience never knew, uh, and the viewers in that town never knew that I had a sense of humor. I was straight laced. I, you know, wore a trench coat, three-piece suit, but boom, boom, reported the news. And so <laughs> they strong armed me into the position. Well, actually the person they were going to hire, <laughs> <laughs> never showed up. And so they were desperate. And they said, can you just fill in until we find someone, basically. 
And uh, I'm like, no, thank you. No, I'm where I want to be. I'm happy sending out resume tapes across the country. Something's going to land. And believe it or not, I, so they, they strong arm me into it. I said, okay, I'm going to do everything I can to make them upset, to make them mad, <laughs> to have them throw me off this shift. I'm going to break every rule, with, you know, uh, standards. I'm going to break every rule uh, in journalism, not journalism, but, you know, of shooting and jump out of the shot and just grab random people and, so the more or the harder I tried to get myself removed off the shift, the more the viewers loved it. So <laughs> trying to get kicked off the ship of doing the fun stuff uh, worked against me. And then I was like, I'm not doing this. And then there was something about a really nice pay hike. And I said, all right, I'll do it for a little longer. And my agent at the time had another client in that market. And that client was telling her about me. And she's like, what are you, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, this morning show thing. Don't worry about it. Just keep on sending my stuff. Okay. I sent her a tape of the crazy morning show stuff I was doing, trying to get kicked off the ship. She loved it. She said, oh, my God, can I send it out and just get feelers? I'm like, no. She said, please. I'm like, okay. We got seven offers in 14 days. So, wow. like, okay, that's a sign for something. Well, maybe I'll just start there and then segue myself, back, get to a big market, start there, segue myself back into hard news. And 23 years later, I'm kicking <laughs> it right there. You went from trying to get kicked out to kicking it with Kenny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to get kicked out again. So God has a sense of humor, obvi. He does. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your initial experience like here in Cleveland? Um, it was interesting. I was replacing a hometown girl who had done very, very well in this position. And she was re her family was relocating to Chicago because her husband got a job there. And so initially, I pretty much was on my own. They didn't give me a producer. They didn't get everything. I was like, OK, give us some of that California magic. And I said, well, you realize I'm in Cleveland and you want California magic. OK, so starting from a clean slate was difficult but easy because I knew what I wanted to do. So it was just a matter of researching and finding it. And um, I still had all of the, the, the year and a half of California ideas in my head. So I said, all right, well, let me just try to find everything that I did there here. And then let me act like I'm a tourist, which I basically was. I knew how to get from the station to my apartment at the time. And uh, <laughs> I was located on West 6th Street, which was very, very hot at the time. And I was going around asking everybody, so what do you like to do? What do you do? What's fun? What's fun in the city? What do you like to do? When I would go on shoots, I'm like, give me your top five things you love to do, you and your family, and you know, one of your best friends who you think is really Really, I was taking a survey while I was doing work. And lo and behold, I found everybody in Cleveland has their own little small bubble of cool stuff to do. So... I started exploring everybody's bubbles and found out, and I found myself on East, West, you know, South, North, you know, I found out there was a, a Lake Erie surfing club. When I say North, I'm like in the water, yeah. So uh, doing that, it became really interesting. It was like a living PhD dissertation of what people like in Cleveland and why they like Cleveland. So that really helped because people started saying, like, wait a minute, that's my little fun group over there. Wait a minute, that's my fun group over there. I had no idea this was here because people tended to live in little bubbles of little pockets. So my point was I'm going to show everybody all these cool little bubbles of pockets scattered all around the metropolitan area. And when I took that approach, then it became really, really fun for me because I was discovering something every single day and learning about some new group or some new project or some new fun event. So it, it became a beautiful experiment in what's happening in Cleveland. And that's how it started. And then it just started snowballing. So once I got into a nice rhythm, it was over. It's very, very cool. And literally 22 years later, I am still finding brand new things that I didn't even know existed that had been here forever. And then there's a whole generation of new things popping in. So it kind of feeds itself. Once people realize, oh, I can bring my unique, cool element here and everybody will dig it, then voila. So that's how it happened. 
You can never say there's nothing to do in Cleveland. <laughs> you can, that's the only that's for people sure. who think there's nothing to do in Cleveland are people who are not even trying to find stuff to do in Cleveland. Exactly. Yeah. So what would you say 22 years ago when you started versus now, what's been the biggest change in your specific role? That's a good question. Well, the biggest change, I would say, in my role at the station is to make sure I cover everything and everybody. It was Kenny the crazy guy when I initially got here. And then I would have soccer mom say, hey, I have some kids who are at this certain age. Can you find some fun stuff for our do? I had retired people say, well, we're empty nesters. So what is it? So it really changed from, I'm going to show you all this cool, crazy stuff that I love to do that I hope you guys dig to everybody asking me, can you find something for me to do for my family, for empty nesters, for dinks, dual income, no kids, for people who just get here, who don't know how to uh, get into the social network of maybe going to Cleveland plays and playing volleyball or softball or football or flag football. So my role has really changed because now I think, okay, okay, what are soccer moms like? What are empty nesters like? What are the college kids like? What do, what does everybody like? and try to find that and then show or display that to the viewers. That has been a big change from my personal <laughs> playground to everybody else's playground from every demographic. You know, most people, especially in media, uh, strive for your level of notoriety and success. What would you say is the biggest pro and the biggest con of it? Um, the pro is you really get to discover tons and tons of unique stories. There's a saying in journalism, everybody has a story, which is true. And people, when you get to a certain level, people feel compelled. Hey, let me tell you. And I'm like, okay. And most of them are very, very interesting. Um, the con, and be prepared for this, is privacy. You know, the, the lack of privacy. If you, if, if you go grocery shopping, be prepared, for, be prepared for someone to pleasantly, hopefully, um, want to come up and talk to you and interrupt your grocery shopping. If you go out to eat with your significant other, there'll probably be a chance, even though you guys are out trying to spend some quality time, someone might come over and say, hey, I just want to say this or say that or say this. So you have to learn to be um, gracious about that. And, and nine times out of 10, people are very tactful and polite. Um, so, but be prepared. You, television is something you don't turn off because people see you all the time. And if you're popular, they feel, oh, hey, I like that person. I'm going to go talk to him. So understanding that. And then, of course, you know, in the age of social media, everybody's a critic, too. So be prepared to be criticized about every single thing you do. It doesn't mean it's true, but you, you have to... Stephanie Schaefer says you have to get duck feathers. If you, if you throw water on a duck, it just beads up. It doesn't soak in. It just rolls off. And so uh, be, you have to be prepared for that. And of course, on some days, it's easier said than done. But understanding that right. uh, is, the, I would say, one of the biggest cons if you're not prepared to handle it. A lot of people just get out of the business because they don't see that aspect and they choose not to put all the work in to that to make it a, a factor that doesn't negatively affect you. Oh, that's great advice. Great advice. Now, I've had the good fortune of being your intern when you being one of the people to help convince me to go back to school to finish my degree. And yep. thank you again for that. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I found it to be so beneficial in so many ways, shapes and forms and levels. But I'm not really hearing as much of internship programs, particularly in television anymore. What is your take on internships, its importance or non-importance, and the future for students trying to get into the industry? I think it's, I think they're imperative. I only had, to, I was required to have one internship to graduate from college and I had eight because I learned early on and I had some mentors. I was very fortunate. I had some mentors in Dallas uh, which is a top 10 market, who told me, Kenny, intern as much as you can. Even I interned there in a couple of stations. Intern as much as you can, but because it gives you insight to the entire spectrum of what television is about. 
There's some people who come in and they want to be on air and they look at the production side and from, from producing to editing to camera work. And I said, you know what? I really would like to do that. I didn't know that was so cool. I didn't know that was so difficult. I didn't know that was so challenging and the creativity comes in. So you, you, and you can't learn that if you're not boots on the ground uh, in television stations to learn. I mean, when you were my intern, you realized there's a lot of work that goes into just one day of yeah. on air up. And you're working with a lot of people from my engineer, from my the executive producer of the bigger show I work on to my boss who has to approve what I do. There's so many aspects. And I really hope that stations continue to allow internships. I think they're imperative in understanding. I think the negative aspect of that is since it's so easy to just take your phone and put yourself in front of billions of people uh, through social media, the more you practice it, the more you, the better you believe you are. Does it mean that you're doing everything in the way we do it, the way we're trained to do it from voice and diction to lighting, to framing, to AVL, audio, video linkage, when you're putting a story together, all of that comes into play. And you really understand that when you get a formal education on journalism and, and, and understanding, okay, for each fact, you need to have at least two sources to back up each fact you put on air. So that's not being emphasized anymore because the standards, the well, are literally are very, 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 very few journalistic standards, if any, associated with social media. So students need to understand the difference between true journalism and facts that are being, well, lack of facts that are being thrown out on social media. They're two different things. And I think that has hurt the industry so much because it's because people can get information instantly. It doesn't mean that it has, it is factual. Case in point, when there was that terrible shooting in Chardon and we were getting students who were on their phone saying, hey, I'm in here, I'm in here, or I'm standing outside, uh, a couple of things. Uh, the authorities said, don't put any of that on air because we don't want the, the other person, the, the bad person to know. So we don't want them to have any kind of advantage. And number two, we didn't know if those were truly students there. We couldn't verify that they were mm -hmm. students. Okay, they were calling yeah. it that we didn't know. So, it, it, but some people just go, oh, we got here. Okay, show us video. We're going to put it on air. You don't know who that is, what their intention is. You don't know if it's verified facts. And for, uh, for us, it was a safety measure. We didn't want to also endanger the lives of the other kids there. Absolutely. So when you go through internships, you understand all of these variables to remain solid with the principles of journalism and not just, I'm gonna show people a whole bunch of things, <laughs> you know, on social media. So I believe that. Are you true. seeing interns, are you seeing interns still being used at the station and, and other stations or is it kind of a dying down program? Well, we had a solid one, but then COVID changed everything. So, um, mm. and now they're doing some just shadowing, you know, uh, People are coming in and being shadowed. They can shadow for one day. And da, da, da. So I think eventually we will get back to that. Um, but COVID, as you know, threw a wrench into the entire universe. So, yeah. um, but we always had a solid program. You know, unfortunately, you know, we don't have a million internships, but we still have one. And I just think it's, it's look what happened to you. I mean, it led to your career. It, uh, it led to, we had a reporter who was with us for a little while, led to her career. So, I mean, they can literally help, but I think the insightfulness yeah. to understanding what this business truly is about is imperative for the up and coming generation of journalists. So back in Texas, yep. you were sending out your um, demo <laughs> tapes to different uh, companies and that. What's now the process for students? It's interesting. Um, I mean, that's still, if you have, because I literally had a tape, that's how old I am. Um, a lot of students are making their own YouTube page with their, uh, with their stories on it. So that, in a sense, has replaced the, um, the resume tape. But students still have to, they need a digital resume of their work 
to be able to email to news directors or executive producers because they need to have access to your work. So you don't have to put on a tape now, but you definitely need to digital representation. A lot of students have their own YouTube pages or they have a specific resume tape YouTube page that they can just punch up, but I can send it to you there and, or I can email it to you. So always have that available because positions don't remain open for a long period of time. So if you are lucky enough for someone to say, hey, send me your stuff right now, you need to be able to press the button and send it to them. So always keep it updated, always keep it clean, always keep it concise, concise. keep your best stuff up front. You know, if you do, if you do a really great story Tuesday, Monday, uh, Wednesday morning, it better be on your updated digital resume tape. Great tip, great yeah. tip. Um, you mentioned COVID. Yeah. From your perspective, for you personally, how did COVID change your career and your thoughts on your, not just the role you have now, but your career in general? Well, it changed everybody's life. I don't care what you did. It just, it was just a big impactful element for two years that we all had to deal with. For me, I'm the guy who breaks up the gloom and doom of the news. I'm the guy who shows you the really cool events that are happening out in the city. And I remember- You're always interacting with people. <laughs> right, because that's what people want to see, interact. And the entire world shut down. And I remember my boss saying, we got we got, can you, we got to get you back on air. We got to show some normalcy. And I'm like, there's nothing normal. There's nothing normal about what's happening. This is a world pandemic. What do you want me to do? Run out? and say, there's nothing happening over here, which there was, there's nothing happening over here, which there was. So that changed, I'm like, okay, well, let me, since everybody is sitting at home and they have access to their laptops and computers, might be a really cool event, but here's something that's very, very interesting. Here's some really cool army training video. Here's, a great, here's some great video from uh, National Geographic on their website, this guy who followed whales for 45 minutes underwater. So I went, I used the internet, it became my world to show people very cool, interesting, fun things that they could watch to take their minds for, if only the briefest of seconds, off the gloom and doom. So for me, it was a huge exploration. And here again, I'm thinking of every demographic. Uh, from sports to NASA to wildlife to adventure stuff to, you know, funny stuff with guys who throw frisbees. So it changed my perspective on everything because I had to try to find something different to show to make people say, wow, I really wouldn't normally watch that, but that is very, very interesting and visually stimulating. And it was tough. It really was. I'm not going to lie, you know, because when you an event and interacting with people, there's magic right there. You can see me clicking with them. You can see me uh, cracking jokes to keep them loose. You can see me learning. Wow, that's really interesting. I didn't know that you could throw a boomerang 745 feet and have it come back, and you get to see that. So that interactive element being taken away was a huge struggle for me. I think it's the reason why I appeal so much to people because they see me interacting. They, they relate to that. So it was tough. I'm not going to lie. It, it was tough trying to find the interesting things to show people to make them say, wow, that is really cool. Instead of, I love the way he's interacting with individuals. But you know, I think the key takeaway with that though is one, showing how quick on your feet you can be. Because that's life, right? But especially in this industry, things change all the time. You have to be able to pivot. You got to roll the punches. I uh, Back to the internship with you, I was with you when the Chardon shooting happened and we are about to go live at the Botanical Gardens talking about edible flowers. But we had to pivot because you're not going to talk about that. Well, something tragic is happening, but you just pivot and you're like, okay, what's the next thing we can do? How can we help? Where do we need to go? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think you talking about that with COVID is something that people should recognize is that at any moment's notice, you got to be able to think fast and what can you do to, to change and pivot? You, you found a way to keep the fun and keep the engagement and do it safely, right. socially distant, <laughs> from your own home in your pajamas, exactly. not depressed, 
<laughs> you know, right. there's still life out there, even if we have to be separate at the moment. So kudos to you for that. And that's a great tip and advice for people. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And that you're right. You have to be ready to pivot at any moment. You are exactly right, Leah. So for those that are professionals, what would be your biggest piece of advice to them right now as far as where the media landscape is going and what you've learned? Stay true to the values of journalism that have been established since the very beginning of time. And I think the most important aspect of that, number one, is to make sure true journalism is on social media. There needs to be a huge presence of true, if people are gonna choose not to watch their TVs anymore and watch everything on their phone or their laptop, we need to make sure as professionals that true journalism remains on those phones and on those laptops, just like everything else. It's like you can pop up a video with Jay-Z, you know, or Drake, you need true journalism on that phone. And for us, that emphasis, is, I can't overemphasize how important that is. Um, so people start to realize, okay, there's people just spewing random stuff out there. And then there are true vetted facts that are out there as well. And that really has hurt us because people want to jump to sites that just have their opinion and no facts. Everybody, everybody has a right to their opinion, their own opinion, but facts are facts. And those are two different things. Opinions and facts are two different things. And I think that line is being skewered so much. It's being so much. smushed so much. And it's and it's hurting us. It's hurting the country. And you can see it. You can feel it. And as journalists, it's our job to put those facts out there and have the facts, the vetted facts for people. Take back the credibility. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So for those that are students or have aspirations to work in media, what would be your biggest piece of advice? Study as much as you can. Um, become a good writer. People don't understand how much writing goes into journalism. Um, so write as much as you can. I write in my mind and I write live. I don't put it down on paper, but I'm already thinking about questions I'm going to ask my interview, which most reporters write down, okay, I'm gonna ask them this question, that question, this question, that question. I try to make my journalism so conversational, people don't even realize I'm interviewing someone. And an interview is writing. You write an interview, you write to their answer, you listen to their answer, and then you write your next question based on that answer. So I do all that mentally, but I do write a lot at home. People don't see that, know that about me, but I do a lot of writing. So write as much as you I'm a research nerd. You know, you don't have to research for a dissertation, but if there's something you have a question about, learn how to research it very, very quickly and get the facts about it. We, you saw that in the internship, but what is this thing? And boom, all of a sudden you just start researching. You need to be able to research and find the facts about anything and everything uh, as fast as you can. That's such a big part of journalism because the world is your newsroom and there's so many things that happen in the world. And, and of course we can't know and understand everything, but we sure can research it very quickly and get the information we need to ask the intelligent questions about the subject matter. That would be my biggest advice. And then have an insane work ethic. Uh, after the interview, I'll probably, to, right today, I'll probably get something to eat. And as I wind down, before I go to bed, I'll jump on the computer and start doing research on some story ideas I had earlier today, but I just wanted to leave the station. <laughs> so, because I had to come home for the interview. But you don't turn it off. A true journalist never turns it off. You, if you're on a vacation with your family and your significant other, other and meritus or the Maldives, okay, turn it off for a minute. But when you come back, you know, you always have to think about the next story or what's going on in the world because the world, your city, your state, the world is what we cover. So I guess too with that, you have to always have the hunger. You yes. have the want, have the want. And we have, we have awesome days and we have horrible days. So you have, that's when you truly be tested. How much do you want it? How much do you want it? Because there's always unforeseen work 
<laughs> that people never know about until you get into the job. I mean, you found that out yourself with your career. I mean, you started as one thing. Uh, well, yeah, we want you to run this and add this. All right, really? Well, then they need to make the, the, the So you understand that. So be prepared for that. What do you think is the biggest misconception people have of people that work in the news, especially if you're on a morning show, which is yeah. like, you know, the different hours have a different vibe. And mm -hmm. a morning show is, you know, you're, you're waking up with everybody and it's a little bit yeah. more happy. You're kind of like, you have to give the bad news, but you're doing it a little gently compared to like 11 p.m. where it's like, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. So what would you think is the biggest misconception for people in the news, especially in a morning show? I think the biggest misconception is that it's easy. It, that it's easy and this is just... Uh, stuff that's just thrown on our table. Oh, it looks like fun. Uh, one of the most amazing producers we have at the station is Margaret Dakin, and she is responsible for the content everybody sees there. And to watch all of the research she does when we have interviewer, interviewers coming in, the research on the subject matter, and we have meetings with the anchors. Okay, you're gonna talk about this. Now, this person's written a book. The reason why this is so important, research shows that this is the third leading cause of toenail infection in the United States of America. Why is that important? That can lead to this. So there's so much research and tons of preparation that goes into that show. And that show is a beast. That's six hours. That is six hours that we're trying to give new content. And I think people think, oh, it's the morning. Yeah. They have no earthly idea the tons of work that goes in to inform you, make it fun, make it cool, make it educational. But it's work. It's work, 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 work. Everybody else has a one hour show. We have a six hour beast. So that is the biggest misconception that it's easy and it's not. We make it look easy, but they don't see the tons and tons and tons of hours that goes into every single hour of that show every single day. That's for sure. <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> so Kenny, any last piece of advice for us? For students coming in, my advice would be become, you never stop being a student of the job. Always try to become better at your craft, no matter how hard you have to work, no matter how difficult the days are, work and try to become better at your craft. Study, study other, study re reporters who are at the network study their techniques of their voice and diction, their techniques of how they write a story, their techniques of how they work with their editor to edit a story, their techniques of their standards. I still do that to this day. I research people that network to, ah, all right, I really like the way they put that stand up together. Now I'm gonna do that in my next morning show, but I'm gonna do it for three minutes. Now here's the variables I'm gonna use for that. Um, I do that all the time. And, and, I, and I would say that to my fellow journalists who are still doing it. I mean, the true journalist, Neil Zerger, the king of the one tank trips, this year in his 80s came out with another book, his final book that he's putting out about interesting places to visit in the state of Ohio. And the man is in his 80s and he hasn't repeated one of the interesting places he's been to before. I mean, that is a testimony to what it takes. So that would be my advice. Well, Kenny, it's a wonderful advice. And I thank you so much for sharing all of this with us and, and being with us and being a part of CAB. Uh, how can people find you if they want to contact you and kick it with you? Just go to our website. Uh, you know, go to our website. It's huge, it's massive, but it says contact us. And then when you go into that window, then there's windows, reporters or anchors to give them a story. Uh, they give our, our, our work email address there and it goes from there. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Kenny. And I am very, very proud of you and everything that you have done from the school to your amazing career to becoming the president of CAB, which is something I haven't even done. And here you are, you know, 75 years younger than me. <laughs> oh, I'll recruit you. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> you're in line. <laughs> and, yeah, and you're killing it. So I am extremely proud of you. You represent the future of what journalism true journalism 
is to me. So congratulations to you on a great run.